Welcome to How the Light Gets In online festival and to the mystery of reality. At the heart of our understanding of reality is physics, the cornerstone of science. But it appears to be in all sorts of trouble. For decades, it's been predicted that we would find supersymmetry, a set of parallel particles for all we currently understand to exist. It was supposed to be the solution to many inconsistencies and deep puzzles of our current theory. 10,000 scientists collaborated to build the Large Hadron Collider to find the evidence. But year has followed year and no evidence of the predicted supersymmetric particles has been found. So is supersymmetry dead? And with it, string theory, the theory of everything, and the life's work of many leading particle physicists. Is our underlying theory of everything, the standard model, fundamentally mistaken? Must we conclude that the whole framework of contemporary physics might be wrong? And if so, where can we turn for an alternative? To help us debate this question, we have John Ellis. Hi, how are you doing? John Ellis is the um, Maxwell Prize winning physicist whose research, among other things, is concentrated on discovering supersymmetric particles and is the last man alive who understands how CERN actually works. Jim Baggett, a science writer who pens books for a general audience about various aspects of physics, and has been, I think it's fair to say, Jim, an outspoken in opposition of what you call fairy tale physics. Is that fair? And Sabina Hossenfelder um, is a theoretical physicist working on quantum gravity and modifications of general relativity, and um, also documents her ideas on the popular and rather feisty blog Back Reaction. Hello, Sabina. Hi. Is supersymmetry dead? John, do you want to do you want to kick off for us? Okay, well, I'm, uh, I'm happy to try. Uh, so perhaps I better say right from the beginning that I'm not a sort of a supersymmetry ultra. Uh, my research interests have always focused on phenomenological aspects. I wouldn't say just of particle physics, but also uh, astrophysics and cosmology. And uh, so I, I'm kind of a sort of an opp opportunistic uh, scientific primate who will pick up whatever tool is lying around in the hope of uh, being able to use it to uh, crack uh, what the debate title is called the mystery of reality. So, so let, let me just sort of situate where we are currently with, uh, with particle physics, because uh, the question was raised whether the standard model is, is mistaken or not. It, it's not mistaken. The, the standard model works perfectly fine. The issue is rather that the standard model leaves open a whole bunch of extremely important questions. Uh, let me just mention one just to get started. That is dark matter. So the astrophysicists, the cosmologists, tell us that there must be some additional stuff out there which gravitates, but we don't know what else, if anything, it does. And uh, I think it behooves us physicists to try to solve that mystery which uh, concerns you know, far more matter than the actual visible matter that's described by the standard model. So the standard model is not mistaken. It has open questions. And for me, that doesn't mean to say that physics is in trouble. It means that there's a fantastic opportunity. Uh, I would also take issue a little bit with you saying that the LHC was constructed to find supersymmetry. It, was constructed to do many things, one of them, of course, being to find the Higgs boson, which it did, and it continues to look for supersymmetry. Excellent. Now, to, to come to the S word, <laughs> so, so I, I actually check my publications. So 15% of my publications have the word supersymmetry or supersymmetric in the title. And you know, it reflects the fact that supersymmetry is one of the tools that I like to use to crack the mystery of reality, but it's not the only one. Uh, so, so, so why do I think that supersymmetry might be an interesting tool? It's not particularly because it's, it's beautiful. I think that uh, something which works well is beautiful. I, I was interested, I think principally my interest was triggered by the possibility that supersymmetry could provide the dark matter. I was also interested in the way that supersymmetry could help us construct grand unified theories. And I'm also interested because supersymmetry enables us, with certain assumptions, to calculate correctly the mass of the Higgs boson. But my interest has always been in practical aspects of supersymmetry. 
and that's well, actually one reason I, why I don't pay so much attention these days to strings. You know, back in the 1980s, I worked a bit on string theory and string model building, but I basically gave up on that because it seemed to be very difficult to make contact with reality. So anyway, there you are. I'm interested in theories that can help us understand the mystery of reality. Thanks, John. Jim. Right, so uh, my perspective on this whole debate um, is, is really just a question of uh, very, simply, very simply, honesty and integrity. Particularly at a time like this, we're here having a virtual festival because of a pandemic that swept across uh, Europe and the US and is now sweeping across South America, where uh, the messages from our governments about following the science are fundamentally important for us as citizens to decide what it is we do and how we behave. And for this to work effectively, we, we've got to have some level of trust in scientists. Now, physics is the hardest of the hard sciences. Um, and, and yet, and, and I'm not pointing any accusing fingers at, at John in, in this particular situation, but the very framing of this debate, as David has just given it, tells us that something fundamental has gone wrong. Because the standard model is not super string theory and supersymmetry. The standard model is a set of so-called quantum field theories, which work perfectly well, but as John says, are full of explanatory holes. Now, that's unsatisfying because we'd like answers to some of the questions that we, we have about dark matter and uh, Higgs mass and other things. But as a result of the hype surrounding supersymmetry and string theory for something like the last 30 or 40 years. There's now a great confusion, I think, amongst the general public of the status of these theories. These theories aren't actually theories, they're ideas. They're ideas that have been put forward by theoretical physicists that are no doubt extremely well founded, but they're ideas. And somehow as a result of endless streams of popular science books and documentaries and articles published in the popular press, we have this general idea that these, these are the, the theories that explain the nature of our reality. They do not. Okay. If you think of supersymmetry like a car, we, we test drove this car at the large electron positron collider years ago. We test drove this car at Fermilab in, uh, in, uh, in, in the US. We test drove this car around a 26 kilometer circuit called the Large Hadron Collider and every time the car broke down. Now we have a glossy brochure that tells us what supersymmetry will do for us and you've got to make it, now make a choice. This car has broken down many, many times. Do you still believe what the glossy brochure about this car tells you? Or do you decide, in fact, that that's actually not a car? All you've got is the glossy brochure. Thanks, Jim. Sabina. Yeah, so I, I think I would like to directly answer your question, is supersymmetry dead? Um, the answer is no. It, you could say it's undead. Uh, you can't kill it. Uh, and and that's, that's a problem. Um, so it, it helps to look a little bit at the history that uh, Jim already outlined a little bit. Uh, supersymmetry um, goes back to an entirely mathematical idea, or actually I should say ideas, because it was simultaneously discovered by several people sometime in the 70s. And uh, it was then uh, recognized, as John already said, that it would make uh, a potential explanation for dark matter uh, and it would aid the unification of the interactions. And, and that, I think, excited a lot of particle physicists. However, supersymmetry ran into conflict with experiment already um, in the 1990s, very early. And it then had to be fixed uh, by adding another assumption on top of it so that it would still be viable. And then it was expected to show up uh, at the Tevatron and at LAP and then ultimately at the LHC. And that um, was just not the case. And um, so I don't think that's particularly convincing uh, for a theory. Um, the other problem with supersymmetry is that you said in the introduction that it solves inconsistencies. It does not. It is an entirely superfluous um, idea. It does not actually solve any problem. 
the only reason that um, a lot of particle physicists like it is that, as I keep saying, it's uh, pretty. Um, they were hoping it would solve certain problems, uh, but in the end it turned out um, it did not. And uh, John uh, rather confusingly said that it helps you to calculate the Higgs mass. Um, this is just not the case. You can't calculate the Higgs mass with or without supersymmetry. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, if, if I've understood you, basically, we, we, we have a rather elegant, naive, beautiful idea. I'm, I'm, I'm hesitating to say theory because of what Jim said but certainly an idea, and it's beautiful when it springs out of the mathematics. So the, the, I suppose the question is, if supersymmetry was correct, um, John, w wouldn't we have actually found convincing physical evidence by now, or do you think we have? Well, I certainly don't think we found evidence for supersymmetry, so uh, at least I found you know, one point of agreement with the uh, other participants in the <laughs> debate. to get pretty much disagree with pretty much everything else. Uh, so, uh, to continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.